And he cried out with a loud voice, Into your hands I commend my spirit. And with that he breathed his last. And the centurion who was standing by praised God saying, Surely this man was innocent. Or as St. Mark reports it, Surely this man was the son of God. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In my imagination at this moment, when he breathed his last, when the centurion says, surely this is the Son of God, the hallways of hell must have resounded with laughter and cheering and the devil jamming his fist in the air, got him! It was a battle that had been going on for a long time. You remember that God has said at the baptism, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And immediately he goes out into the wilderness driven by the spirit and the devil's there to meet him because the devil is not a respecter of persons, even the son of God. And he says to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to be, oh, oh if you are the son of God, Command angels to come and rescue you. If you are the Son of God, let's cut a deal. He's got all kinds of things going. And each time Jesus prevails, and the battle is on. And Luke tells us in the fourth chapter, and the devil departed from him until a more opportune time. There were plenty of opportune times that came. I suspect an opportune time was when Judas is open to the invasion of, of the evil one himself and he makes a deal for 30 pieces of silver to betray the savior of humankind. The devil is no respecter of persons. And this goes back all the way to the beginning. Abraham has his beloved son, finally Isaac, and he has this promise from God that from this son there will come a great nation more numerous than the stars. It's in the 22nd chapter of Genesis. And somehow, because the Bible story tells it like this, God gets worried that maybe Abraham loves Isaac more than he loves God. So he sets up this awesome test. Go to the land of Moriah and sacrifice your son, Isaac, your only son. Does this sound familiar at all? Because 2,000 years later, we're going to hear the same story again. And it's also going to be on Mount Moriah. And Isaac, walking with his dad, carrying some of the goods with the fire and the knife and the wood, says, Hey, Dad, I see the fire, I see the knife, I see the wood, but I don't see the lamb. And Abraham says, the Lord will provide his own lamb, my son. And so they walk off. And you know how the story goes. Abraham has the knife in the air and the angel stops him and there in the thicket there's a ram and they sacrificed the ram on Mount Moriah. Now, ancient Hebrew tradition has said for century upon century that the mountain above which the Temple Mount stands in Jerusalem is in the range of the region of Moriah. When John and Jesus met along the river where John was baptizing, John shouted out, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And not that long thereafter, God does what he asked Abraham to do and relented. God's own son is the Lamb of God on Mount Moriah that takes away the sin of the world. God is no respecter of persons or of moments. 
He did the same thing to, to Job, but I don't have time to go to that story. But the issue with Job was just again, who does God love? Who does Job love? And the devil is no respecter even of God. But when Jesus breathed his last, maybe he hadn't gotten God yet. But he got his son. And the earth thundered and the rocks cracked. And the tail of the temple was torn and the graves were opened. And people went home beating their breasts, saying, what have we done? It doesn't matter. Even a Roman centurion, a grisly man, who's probably presided at a hundred and more crucifixions, says, surely, this was the Son of God. No matter, small issue, he's dead. Got it. And in this moment, when God sacrifices his son, he does a number of things. He teaches us beyond any reason of doubt of the seriousness of sin. Sin kills. It kills opportunities. It kills love. It kills abundant life. And it ultimately kills us. The second thing God demonstrates to us is what he was demonstrating to Abraham, what he demonstrated to our sisters and brothers who this very day tell the Passover story. This constant wrestling with God to redeem and to save and to lift up and to renew and to give new opportunity to his people. It's never changed. The battle has gone on from the very beginning. And I suspect when the sun came, as the parable tells us, between Satan and Jesus, from Satan's side anyway, it began to be profoundly personal. And now Jesus dead. No wonder the earth quaked and the rocks split and the veil of the temple is torn and the people go home thumping their breast and the centurion, the grisly man who's nailed many a hand to a cross finally finds himself saying surely this must have been the son of God. That's the price. My sin, your sin, all the rebellion against God has that kind of price. It could be said dramatically, I suppose, that on Good Friday, God is dead and we crucify him. But he didn't get And God still has the last word. And we're going to come back in our churches, either in vigil or early Easter morning, and we're going to proclaim that last word when people go to a cemetery looking to embalm a body. And the angel says, why do you come to a place of the dead to look for the living? He is risen. He's not here. You see, even in our death, God speaks life. So what does this day mean for us? If it doesn't mean that we've learned what it means to live sacrificially in our love for one another as God has lived so sacrificially for us. Because you see, that's what it costs. It costs spending ourselves 
in the abundant life of others. And then finding out quite by surprise that our life is abundant as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.